Good morning. My name is Lindsay, and I'm a sinner saved by grace. Step 12 reads, Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Our scripture this morning is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say, even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing upon my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was even born. Every day of my life, was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lindsay, for reading that. Today, we're going to be talking about the journey to wholeness and healing. And that is going to be step 12. We've had 11 weeks of talking about breathing underwater and the 12 steps to recovery. So good morning, church family. I'm Steve, and I am a grateful sinner saved by grace. You know, I find that many individuals, unless they're chemically addicted, think the 12 steps of recovery are not from them, that they don't, need to, they don't need this process at all. But I want to tell you a story, and it's about a woman. Let's call this woman Mary and not to be confused with the Mother Mary. But let's talk about Mary for a minute. Mary had issues with control, selfishness, and fear. And due to what was facing her marriage, which was crumbling in her hands, she was headed for divorce. Now Mary, found a person she could communicate with, so she called her her sponsor. Doesn't mean she was in some program of recovery, but it meant that she was with somebody who understood and had been where she had been and what she was going through. So, if we could put the steps on the, on the screen, that'd be great. And if you just follow along with me, you're, you're going to read the steps differently than I am. Step one showed Mary an amazing paradox. Mary found that she was totally powerless over her husband's behavior and choices and acknowledged that she could not change him 
and accepted that when she tried to do so, her life and emotions became unmanageable. She found that the way she was doing things made her life unmanageable. Step two, which tells us, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Mary saw that since she could not restore herself to sanity, a lot of people think that they can make things happen themselves. She couldn't restore herself to sanity, to her right thinking, but some higher power must do what she couldn't do for herself. Step three, she made a decision. Mary turned her will and her life over to the care of God. Regarding her situation, as well as her husband, and the effects of divorce is going to have on their children, trusting in his sovereignty that God would care for them all. Step four, Mary began to search out things in herself which brought her physical, moral, and spiritual bankruptcy. She had to dig. She made a searching and fearless moral inventory of herself. She sat with God and asked for clarifications. Where is the problems in my life? Where am I at fault? In step five, Mary decided that an inventory taken alone wouldn't be enough. She knew that she'd have to quit this deadly business of living alone with her conflicts. And in honesty, confide these to God and another human being. Now, the reason we do this, as we talked about in step five before, was that Mary needs to humble herself if she wants to be regenerated. She needs to make amends with God. She needs to share those amends with another human being so that she can get rid of them. In step six, Mary, had, Mary balked, as I balked. Step six is a very difficult step. Mary, what, what the reason she balked is for a particular reason. She didn't wish to have all her defects of control, fear, selfishness, resentment. She didn't want them removed because she loved some of them too much. When you're going through a recovery and you get into a process in your life, things become regular, and to you they become normal. Mary's looking for a new normal. She's looking to escape the bondage that she has on herself because she has been running her own life up to this point. Yet she knew she had to make a settlement with the fundamental principle of step six. So she decided that while she still had some flaws of character that she couldn't yet relinquish, she ought nevertheless quit her stubborn and rebellious screaming and crying out, no, never. If you can't get rid of one of your defects, I remember telling people when I was getting sober, he said, you're going to have to do a, a, you're going to have to ask God to remove the defects of character. And I said, well, <laughs> whoa, that's me. That's my personality. That's who I am. So I can't just give those up. I, who would I be? My sponsor said, how's that working out for you? I got to tell you, it didn't take much more for me to know that I had to go to step seven. And in step seven, it says, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. Mary did that and asked that she be released from her bondage of self. When we think we know better than God, we've got a mistake going on. We've got a lack of communication going on. God knows all. We know this, if that much. 
So step eight, she continued her daily house cleaning, spiritual house cleaning. For she saw that she was not only conflict with herself, but also with the people, situations in the world that she lived. We live in a beautiful, beautiful world. No crime, nobody trying to get us and throw us off the beam, nobody tempting us, nobody doing any of these things. We live in a very interesting world. Mary had to begin to make peace, so she listed all the people that she had harmed. Then after discussion with her sponsor, and I want to make this a key thought process. If you have to make an amends to somebody, and you know you've got to make that amends, talk to a very trusted, that's what we call a sponsor, a very trusted individual, and go through kind of a role play about that, that amends you're going to make. Because believe me, when we've been thinking in our wrong mind for a long time, going out and doing this is not that easy. You don't know whether the door is going to get slammed in your face, you're going to get a punch in the nose. So you go to your sponsor first, you go to that person that you trust, and you talk through it with them so that they understand what you're getting into. And they may have some advice. They may advise, just write them a letter. You're not going to do anything in person. Write them a letter. If they passed away, burn it. But there are other ways to make amends that are less difficult to do, but you need guidance to get through that. At step 10, she had begun to get a basis for living. And she keenly realized that she would need to continue talking taking her personal inventory, and when she was wrong, she ought promptly admit it. See, once we get step eight out of the way, step 10, step, ten, step eight and nine out of the way, step 10 keeps us focused on recovering, doesn't let us slide backwards as easily. Step 11, Mary saw that a higher power had restored her to sanity, to right mind, and enabled her to live with some peace of mind in a troubled world. Then such a higher power was worth knowing better, right? If you've got a higher power that has rescued you from yourself and your way of life, and got you into a better situation, I really think it's worth getting to know God better. <laughs> By having as much direct contact, which I call prayer, as possible. The Bible tells us, pray ceaselessly. In everything, come to me. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been living in this world for years. And one of the things that I found was that I thought God only wanted me to talk to him about the big stuff. You know, I'm sick. Can you help me? Not get me through the day. <laughs> that sounds like a tall order. Could you, could you lead me around? And, and make sure that I don't do anything stupid today. I mean, in recovery, you don't look at things the same way. By having as much direct contact with God as possible, Mary found the persistent use of meditation and prayer did open the channel so that where there had been a trickle, it was now a river of communication coming through. And she was better able to understand what God wanted from her. You know, it's like any other relationship. Get into a conversation with somebody. Have you ever used the terms, what do you want from me? It's no different with God. I'm looking around the room today and I see hundreds of faces that say, 
How do I know what he wants? <laughs> he wants us, is what he wants. He wants a relationship with us. And the best way to get a relationship going is getting to know the person you're getting into a relationship with. See, God already knows us. He knew us when we were being knit together in the womb. That scripture we read today, I don't think there's anywhere where they said God wasn't. <laughs> God is everywhere, always with us. He tells us there's going to be bad days. He says, in this life, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. That's good news. So now we're at step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. I want to stop here just for a second and make sure we all understand there's ways that this step is written. One of the, one of the ways the, the step is written, it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. No, it is the result of the steps. It's the culmination of the steps. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. As Mary worked through the 12 steps, she was awakened. As the, oh, I'm sorry, she was awakened to God's presence in her life. As Mary walked through the 12 steps, she awakened to God's presence in her life. She sensed his presence and will in her everyday activities. She was able to live out the presence or the, she was able to live out the principles of her recovery honestly, responsibly, responsibly and compassionately. She had experienced a spiritual awakening. People get really hung up on spiritual awakening. I remember one time I was talking to Dr. Juneman. I don't know how many times he had to hear me standing out front going, what does he want from me? <laughs> and John would say, just keep going forward. <laughs> the spiritual awakening doesn't have to be this majestic light that comes down and all this kind of stuff. That's not a spiritual awakening. Some people say they've had them. The spiritual awakening is coming into communion with God, starting to understand who God is, having that relationship with God. And you see, without the 11 steps prior to the 12th, you can't get there. Some of you are probably doing this program and don't even know you're doing it. The steps are put in line for a reason. They move us forward slowly. We're not in a, we're not in a sprint here. We're in a marathon to build a relationship with God. Mary's goal was to share, in, out of step 12, Mary's goal was to share her spiritual life with others. This reinforced the emotional lesson she was learning through the sharing her gratitude for all God was doing in her life. Her life got better, even though Mary could not have chosen, would not have chosen divorce, her life still got better. With God, Anything is possible. Through the sharing of her gratitude for God, what was God was doing in her life, by working the steps, Mary found that she could experience the joy of living even in the midst of her painful reality. And by the way, recovery is reality. It brings us to see the real picture and not this fictitious picture we've been living with for so long. Practically every person in any kind of recovery says that no satisfaction has been deeper and no, no joy greater than the 12-step well done. To watch the eyes of men and women open those aha moments I get it. 
What a change. What a change you can see in somebody's life. They have purpose and meaning. Families are re reinstated. They're reassembled. To see these people awaken in the presence of God in their lives, these things are the substance of what we receive when we carry the 12 steps of the program. So why look at the 12 steps as a road to recovery? Richard Rohr says, he is the author of Breathing Underwater, he says, until people's basic egocentricity is radically exposed, revealed for what it is and foundationally redirected, much religion becomes occupied with rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic cruise ship. Sailing alongside other isolated passengers, each maintaining their own personal programs for happiness while the whole ship is sinking. There is nowhere in the Bible that I know of that it says you've got to do this alone. God always tells us we need each other. We need each other. We can't do this alone. In recovery, we're reminded that we must serve others. This is not something that we're given as a suggestion, by the way. It's a vital part of the recovery process. The re those in recovery are, are told very clearly and very early in recovery, we must give it away to keep it. Give it away to keep it. I'm not going to quote him, but Richard Rohr, when he was talking in his, in his book, Breathing Underwater, talked about this a little bit, and he said, in his over 40 years as being a priest, the times he's been counseling people and working people through the programs of recovery, it has increased his faith. It has increased his relationship with Christ. It has increased his trust through working with others. Luke 23, 31, 32 says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. When you have repented, and turn to me again, strengthen your brothers. Pass along how you did it. You see, in recovery, it's where we were, what happened, and what we're like now. And that just doesn't just apply to drugs and alcohol. The reason it gets that label is because they got the big book. They got the 12 and 12. They took this program and embraced it because they knew God was the only way. And that without some guidance to go through a transformation in your life, you're going to have a hard road to hoe. It doesn't make any difference what the conflict is. Matthew 10.8, as Jesus is giving instructions to his He's, he prepares to send the 12 out. He says, what was given to you freely must be given away freely. We can't hoard God's blessings. We can't hoard what we know on how our lives have changed. I don't want to not have those conversations. I want people to know. I know a guy named Jesus Christ. And he's the most amazing person in my life. But we also need to realize our part is to stay on track. And so every day. It's a one-day-at-a-time program. 
as our personal relationship with God grows, it is imperative when we read his word, we must challenge ourselves not only to read and understand the word, but to do what it says. Been with people many times, somebody will come up to me and say, hey, did you see this scripture? Isn't that cool? Yeah. So what are you doing about it? What? <laughs> By the way, my wife didn't do this. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> she was in Florida. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> James 122 through 125 or through 25 says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing your face in the mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget where you heard it or what you heard, God will bless you for doing it. The Bible is a guide for life. I found that no matter what I'm going through, if I look in the Bible and I say I'm angry, it will give me scriptures. People today have the world by the tail when it comes to the Bible. Google, <laughs> you go to Google, you can find any scripture for any reason, for any type of behavior that you can, that you can think of. They'll, they've left no stones unturned when it comes to the Bible. Let me close with this. Remaining in recovery is similar to what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 5. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me they can do nothing. We can't, prance, we can't practice the principles of the 12 steps without being connected to God. I found that out personally. I was sober for 10 years and I said, I got this. I know what I did wrong. And I moved all the way from Massachusetts to Tennessee to get away from the crazies that were going to these AA meetings because they didn't know what they were doing. I got to Tennessee in two weeks I was drunk and I stayed that way for 12 years until I got arrested. That was my aha moment. I knew the only answer for me was God. God and a program of recovery because I didn't know how to fix it. And most people are fixers. I couldn't fix that. So we can't practice them without being connected to God. Our priority is to apply these steps in any problem, event, situation, job, or relationship. In other words, through anything that life throws at us. Now I can tell you, there's probably somebody sitting in the sac sanctuary today saying, why didn't he do that the other day? <laughs> life is not easy. Keeping a strong relationship with God sometimes is difficult especially when you have a past that keeps calling you. When I get stressed and I get uncomfortable, many times I go back to where I was comfortable, even though I hated it. It doesn't last very long, but I don't drink, I don't drug, but I still have some of those character defects that I pray every night that God removes from me. And that's really what we have to focus on. And I only can do that one day at a time. If somebody said, you gotta live the rest of your life like this, nope, can't do it. I can do it today, but I don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Yesterday is history, I can't fix it. It's gone. When we connect with Jesus by deepening our conscious contact, he enables us to live more effectively, responsibly, and joyfully. 
even when you walk through illness, injury, divorce, death, pick any subject, if God is with us, we can get through anything. And we can have peace as we go through it, knowing He has us. He's got us by the hand. He's not going to let us go. He loves us. He wants us to be happy. I mean, he didn't say, I want you to be miserable on earth, and then when you come to heaven, you can be happy. No. He wants us to be joyous and free here while we do his work for him. I want to thank you all for walking through these 12 steps with us. It's quite a journey. Steps of recovery are for all, not just those suffering from chemical addiction. And that's really a strong message I want to make sure you hear. Remember, once someone ceases to use chemical substances, alcohol, drugs, the issue they face is not the chemical addiction anymore. That's out of their system. They, they become problems with a thinking problem and a heart problem problem and I'm not talking about heart attacks I'm talking about from here to here beginning that relationship and that walk with Christ that's what the 12 steps are all about and they're for anybody we're here for you and with you God bless. Would you stand and sing together? Hmm? Oh,